So good morning, everyone. Uh, we're back here for another uh, Unleashed Kids Hangout on air this uh, at least Saturday morning in the U.S. And uh, uh, we've uh, got the connection going to um, uh, Manitoba for the uh, XSCE school server. And um, the, so all the guys are online. And uh, since this is our first um, Hangout on air, sort of done group-wise, uh, trying out all the Google Plus events uh, features. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out how to uh, make sure uh, other people can jump into this um, session. So uh, I know uh, Sora Edwards Throw is, is monitoring. Uh, she's our intern. She's monitoring um, the uh, chat um, uh, comment boxes. Uh, we should be live on. Uh, we are live on YouTube. Um, and uh, we'll be checking Twitter as well. Uh, so, uh, and then, and while we uh, start uh, the discussion, I'm going to uh, continue fiddling with our uh, invite button to to make sure that uh, I haven't missed some critical setting. Um, but let's uh, do introductions here. Um, maybe start with uh, uh, Jerry and Adam. Hi, I'm Jerry. Jerry is our host here in. Uh Back in the capital, we just wrapped up our sprint, so we're back in uh, Winnipeg, capital of Manitoba. I'm Adam Holt. This is the Canadian screen, by the way. <laughs> we got two Canadians on this screen. The other is for the Americans, those colonialists who came into Canada to help us out. Uh, you were able to uh, send us some pictures, which are on Flickr, and I'll, I'll try to get those links uh, posted uh, as, as we talk. But... Um, uh, is is that uh, inset that I made for you guys uh, the actual location of where the innovation was happening? Pretty much, indeed. Okay. It looks it looks homey. Um, so George and uh, Dave. Well, uh, this is the first time we've come come to Jerry's. Home. We've been going to uh, Adam's home for maybe three other sessions. Um, basically, it's a it's a go visit the other workers and work together. It's been a, been fun, and I I'm really happy that we've had so much success this last week. And this is our uh, our first uh, video chat, so we're all a bit nervous here. That's and then Jerry even put on pants, so it's a it's a pretty big event. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I've probably done more video in these uh, hangouts than I have uh, on air the rest of my, you know, career. So, um, uh, what's great about this uh, medium is that uh, you know, it, there's you can make it as formal or as informal as you want, and uh, uh, practice makes perfect. So it's it's a great. Um, uh, way to do it is just, is just, just to dive in. Um, I, I do want to go around and um, maybe we start again with uh, Jerry if we go uh, just into a little more detail individually about um, how you came to this effort. I mean, just keep it to you know two or three minutes each, uh, and what what uh, your actually uh, your role is with this uh, sprint. So Jerry. Uh, I guess my role goes back a few years when uh, I got uh, tasked by Martin to make the uh, active antennas work on the school server. Uh. That's how far back my experience goes with the school server. And uh, later on, uh, Australia had uh, contacted me to uh, make a single arm, uh, just a, a single interface version of the XS for the use on a uh, school network that's already pre-existing. And from there, uh, it's grown back, grown back to uh, keeping it current. And, and so what does that in, involve uh, uh, in terms of um, you've been working on major revisions to the server software? Uh, I, th I thought you had done some stuff for Australia. Or? Yeah, I, I've uh, in the past done some work for Australia uh, back uh, modifying the XS6 version to uh, work in their environment. And um, right now, it's it, uh, the big part of it was porting it to ARM, and that was George's doing. 
And so we have it successfully running on the XO175s and XO4s, along with the uh, 1.5s. And uh, and then Adam, um, sort of over the last week, uh, have you been uh, the the cheerleader? <laughs> and uh, what what uh, what what aspects have you uh, found uh, pulling you into the project? Well, it's hard for me to remember a year ago, but it was actually um, exactly a year ago in Madagascar that Alex Clyder um, was physically with me from San Francisco. And it was a constellation of, I can't remember, um, probably Sridhar from Australia and George. Um, I can't remember. I'm sure there was other people, probably Samir Verma, who, uh, who just kept reminding me that, that um, Daniel Drake's especially solid work of January of that year um, had brought the school server back to life in, in many senses because it, it had been a, a little bit stale for a couple of years prior to Daniel's work. And there was a possibility to, to bring a community around Daniel's work. So I, I thought that was a great idea. And so it was exactly a year ago, um, July, 2012, that uh, we started to, we started to invite more and more people to contribute. And that first meeting was in September outside Toronto when a lot of the OPC Canada and, Kenya people joined us and uh, yeah so this is our fifth meeting and onwards <laughs> well that's great uh, and uh, just off uh, off screen here I think I had a little mini breakthrough realizing that uh, um, invitations to others um, are only go out when you're live so I've just invited 113 people <laughs> and so let's see let's see what happens um, so George, uh, same question. Um, uh, what, what would you like to describe in terms of what you've been working on? I, I got started a little bit yeah. before the, um, before uh, the mid of last year. I think I right after the summit uh, two years ago, I started uh, thinking about. Well, I guess it started when I went to Haiti. Adam took me down to Haiti and I had some experience of the, of the lack of power down there and started thinking about how we had the opportunity at least to be low power if we could get the server running on ARM. So I started trying to figure out how to cross compile and into our native ARM and had so much difficulty with it I said well maybe I can just native compile. So I started using an XO 1.75 to native compile and that worked very well. So. Uh, soon, probably in March or so, Sridhar from Australia called me and said, you know, we are thinking about putting a, a school server in and we'd like a little ARM processor to do it and maybe what you're working on would be useful. And he introduced me over the internet to uh, Jerry. So Jerry and I talked a bit and Sridhar tried to describe what a school server would be in his context. And uh, it just sort of grew from that. And uh, when we got together in, uh, in the fall of that year, uh, it was the first time I had met uh, Jerry, but we seemed to click. And we had uh, a real challenge to, to rewrite things so that we could get the same function on, this, on the ARM and on a 1.75 that, that Daniel Drake had in, a, in the 0 .7. And, it took us a few iterations to get back to sort of par with what was already existing on the on the i386 side. So it's grown from there. Now there's so many people involved in this project. It's not just me alone working in my little cubicle. It's it. uh, and Dave, um, wow! I hear I see Activity Central everywhere. So I'm sure there's some story there. And then, and specifically, how you got into the server project. Yeah, this uh, we got. I got involved in this actually going back several years. I've been poking around for a long time, but we never really had the uh, the the momentum to get going forward. And then in February or January, we I saw by uh, Anish that uh, Adam was there as a community leader, being supported by Jerry and George and Tim, another developer. And these guys were all working uh, diligently in their basement, getting this code cranked out. And that to me looked like the start of a solid community project. 
So uh, they had the roots, and now uh, we've just tried to uh, start adding people to support where we can. Yeah, so let me, um, I know that you had mentioned um, ARM a couple times, and uh, I'm sure there'll be people tuning in here um, to see the, our uh, saved version of this broadcast, and uh, uh, and they may have only heard of the X01 five years ago, and, and then now we're talking about school servers and, and newer laptops. So I know that uh, back in 2008, the X01 came, then there was a revision, uh, the X01.5, uh, but then there was a big transition, right, to the to the next model, the 1.75, and now the X04 to the so-called ARM. Can you can you explain? I know I know that a lot of the activities had to be, you know, is it rewritten as a good lay term or ported? But now you're saying that the server software as well, right? This that that would run on on the newest laptops to serve files to its uh, sister laptops within the same Wi-Fi bubble. Is, is that, am I characterizing it correctly? Or well, actually, most of the software is, uh, for the XOs is uh, written in Python, and that transfers from from one base to the other base without much transformation. I think that the challenge for us on the school server, at least Initially, we started out, let's go for the low-power machines if we can and try to make it scalable. So basically, a lot of the work was trying to get the school server functions to, to fit on top of all of the XO trends, the, the, the nature of, of the software stack that's on the XO. And, and since those stacks are different, we had to accommodate both of them, and it took a while to get all of the the corner case is correct, but uh, basically a server is just a is just an XO with a bunch of other services and uh, a little bit more memory and possibly a hard disk. So they're essentially the same machine. Just to give a concrete example, George installed a prototype of this school server community edition in Haiti, running off of an XO one seven five, and I believe it's been. Um, very reliable since March and that George can log in from the US to do maintenance um, which is kind of incredible because it was just a prototype and we were not expecting that level of reliability. It hasn't been all that reliable but it, the problem is that they don't pay their, the bills for the 3G modem so we, we lose connection occasionally at the end of the month until they put another dot nickel in the in the slot. And I think it's useful to um, to recap Tony Anderson's joke that running a school server um, on an XO is kind of like you know moving a freight trains merchandise in little smart cars. So we're aware of that that tension but I, I think it's still very useful so that more people can get involved. People who have XOs and can download the software and think about a small micro deployment. You know, maybe you know, maybe Tony Anderson is going to work with this software in Lesotho in January 2014. For example, he's he's talking about that, and um, that that's really expanding the school server effort to different um, different kinds of contributors. I hope, and well, I think yeah. there's also the the issue of collaboration within a classroom. Uh, Kevin Gordon has done a lot of uh, measuring of how many XOs you can have collaborate with one another and he, he became convinced that without a, a school server uh, announcing who the other classmates were, the airways would become filled with everyone saying who are you, where are you, and all that stuff. So he was convinced that the a uh, single XO acting as a school server, a Java server, if you will, would actually enable many more uh, XOs to collaborate. Well, that's great. Uh, well, uh, we we have uh, a new guest here. Can you uh, hear us, Kevin? Yeah, I'm good. Oh, great! Thanks Can for uh, joining in. 
Okay, and, and back to your ARM question, I would like to highlight that uh, since we're running on Fedora on top, or at least on the XO, we're running on Fedora on top of old PC OS, that uh, we're building on the shoulders of others as Fedora did 90% of the work to get this going on ARM. And OLPC did 8% more to get this running on the XO than we're doing that last remaining 2% to get this running on the server. So uh, this is definitely a building on other project. Yeah, some people watching might not understand that uh, John Watlington and Martin Langhoff were working on this five years ago, possibly more. And that's a, that's a full story that needs to be told. No, that's great. I was going to sort of tease out the fact that uh, if there's been this, uh, uh, you know, a parade of names. Uh, and so that definitely paints a picture of um, the external context of uh, the community work that uh, has gone into this to date. And uh, Dave, that's a great, um, you know, little meme uh, about the 90%, the 8%, the 2%. So uh, it's uh, these uh, sprints are little bursts of work. Um, that are very much incremental. Uh, this is not the kind of thing that you sort of, uh, I guess, get together uh, for a few days or a weekend or whatever, and and and, and it all comes together. It's it's built on uh, years of work. Yes, yep. Ninety percent of again, a very significant portion of the design that we're working from comes straight from OLPC School Server website wiki pages. And. Uh, so it, the, just to go back, uh, you, were, you mentioned uh, it makes a, a lot of sense that you're going to want to run this uh, server software uh, on, a, on a device of some sort to serve other uh, machines and devices nearby. And, and obviously, if you're going to run this, you'll want it on the fastest machine. And, and for us uh, in the um, uh, product line of uh, XOs, you know, the 175 and the one and the XO4 are, I think, the same processor, pretty much the same machines, and you want to run it on the fastest one. Will it run on a on an XO1? Let's say someone has two or three XOs and they just want to see what this software looks like. Um, what what would they do to to get a taste of it? Or can you run it on a Ubuntu on a on a desktop? Well, I have been working on getting the software to run on a on a one. And it takes a lot of special care and feeding. You you have a less less memory, less hard disk, and so whether actually release software and documentation to run on a one uh, this next time, it's not the highest priority. But it's uh, it's in the works. So you know, it's uh, I'm hoping to have something to that people can play with, but it's not ready for, for prime time. It, I'm not thinking that it's a, uh, that it should be actually used in the classroom without much more testing. But there's a, a lot of uh, excitement there, so it, it, may, it may happen. We've seen Samir Verma make it work in a kind of demonstration mode, as well as Jerry and Anna Schoolfield. So it, it's uh, very experimental, but it, it it can happen. Right. What's the uh, document? Go ahead. Sorry. No, What's go ahead. the documentation like? Documentation for setting it up. Well, I mean, it would be a, a uh, wiki page. These steps. I mean, it's uh, not written. Yeah, Kevin, yet. are you meaning on the X01 or in general? In general. Oh, Great. I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess the answer in, is a little bit the same. We have a wiki page or a wiki uh, tree that has information about how to do the installs. And this next release, we're going to have an offline install capability. So it would be very similar to uh, to uh, the install of the operating system. You would download a, a an image and put it on a USB stick and then, then follow the instructions. I don't think it'll be just the four buttons, but it'll be something almost that simple. You could, uh, Jerry's been working on that. Maybe you'd have comments, Jerry. Uh, in Australia, uh, I have a USB uh, 
basically a Swiss Army knife that we use to help uh, maintain our EXOs in the field. And part of that is a menuing system when you first boot up the EXO and you can select different functions uh, once the menu loads. Uh, flash, flash the OS. Uh, the most recent addition would be the customization routine uh, from DynaCore Linux. Okay, and the, on the escalation of hardware side, one thing that I'm hearing from deployments is that uh, on the micro deployment side and the small deployment side, they would uh, like to be able to have the serve this from an XO to reduce their, their inventory and uh, just for exchangeability. But then as the deployments grow larger in size, they're looking at uh, uh, non-XOs with uh, more power, more memory. So the idea is to scale from the smallest who don't want to deal with inventory headaches to the larger who have the resources to deal with, with inventory and other purchases. And it, everyone here knows this, but um, the mailing list server devel when there's a dash in between there is the, the, the real answer to Kevin's question because we've seen people try to install this on a different kind of X0175 with a smaller amount of memory so that's the, that's the true answer. Once you try this out, you may have it installed within half an hour. But um, if you Google server dash devel, you know, at lists.laptop.org, that's the place to read the archives and get involved. Uh, and so it sounds like uh, we're in a little bit of a lull here in terms of equipment availability because the, I know some of the deployments got the XO175s. They were not easy to get uh, through the old PC contributors program, but now the XO4s may be at least obtainable through, uh, you know, this campaign that uh, we've been working on. Um, so I sort of gather that there's going to be a very sort of narrow uh, audience of people who can even try this out if it's specific to the 175? It runs on standard uh, server class hardware also. And it also runs quite well on the 1.5, and I think that's more available. Oh, okay. Um, well, then maybe mention, um, you know, let's say uh, we've got uh, others who may be tuning in and uh, are savvy with um, uh, open source operating systems. What uh, you know, in a major urban area of a Western world, what would someone do um, most expeditiously to download this and install it on a machine that they're likely to have? What, what, what could they do? Uh, the way to get started with that would be to go to schoolserver.org, which is our wiki page, and then click on the uh, link that says 0 0.3, which is the established uh, release, and then there's a, a set of pages from there which go from how to install to how to configure to how to test to how to hack. So that should walk you through, or it, the intention is to walk a person through the steps of getting more familiar with it. And as Adam said, if something's wrong there, please let us know on the mailing list so we can fix it. Uh, so that's good that it runs on one, one XO15s. Um, what would be then, like as someone mentioned, a server software. So it could be any PC running what, um, Ubuntu or Fedora or? At this point, any PC that will run Fedora will run uh, the school server, run Fedora 18. OK, so that, that's great. So they could have just uh, an old machine laying around, and, and it sounds like uh, perhaps adding a Wi-Fi uh, access card to it uh, and, and, and having a Wi-Fi access point nearby would be a good start in terms of hardware. Yeah, pretty much all you need is a couple of network cards. And a, and a USB the, network. Oh, and a USB uh, uh, network adapter as, as an option. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Kevin Cole, uh, are you uh, burning with any questions uh, from across town here? You're, I guess you're at home in D.C.? I am home in D.C., and uh, no burning questions. I'm tr trying to keep up with the links and post them into the chat. But oh, thank you. Not, not doing a great job at that. <laughs> Kevin, for the people watching, which chat 
are you oh on? the oh I'm I'm putting it in the the chat of the um, of the the hangout itself. Cool. If you click on the left side of your screen at where it's oh, says, I see. Yeah. I see. Um, so maybe somebody else can put links links up there. Is that a YouTube.com link? Oh, no, that's a it, good question. I don't know where if it yeah, captures. I, I think area. only only we see that here within the hangout. Okay. So uh, never mind. <laughs> but if you want to cut and paste some of those into uh, like the YouTube uh, comments under the uh, well, actually you shouldn't go there. Um, the uh, the the event page on Google Plus or um, yeah, I think Sora can find a lot of these links as well. Uh, so we'll, we'll we'll get them up if, if nothing else right after the broadcast. Um, so now to keep things interesting on the hardware side, we are also looking at uh, doing some custom XSCE hardware. So we're working with a vendor who is making an all-in-one box that's custom designed to uh, run as a school server. So that should be kind of exciting. It's kind of, if you look at if you see the trim slice, it's very similar to that piece of hardware. Well, uh, Adam uh, sent me a photo of a, of a motherboard which I put up on um, the event page. So anyone who had, had uh, gone to the link to find out about this hangout will have seen that. So I think. So that you have a sample board in, coming, right? Yeah, we have the, the sample board landed a couple of days ago, yeah. and we've got some people down in Spain who are uh, playing with it right now. It's kind of it's interesting, and it has uh, two network uh, two network adapters, which sets it up so it's got no external dongles. It's got an internal hard drive, so there aren't pieces floating around. It's uh, 12 volts, so it can run off a standard car battery. And then this whole unit is enclosed in a aluminum case, so it's uh, pretty rugged. And also, that case should serve as a heat sink. And it's pretty capable. It has a quad core ARM uh, chip, and it has uh, two two or four gigabytes of memory. So it's a a pretty capable uh, and low power server platform. Well, that's really exciting because that's sort of. I mean, I think you 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 do have a considerable number of people out there who know how to go to a wiki page and download a software package and, and mess around with installs but certainly that would be the ultimate is to get you know all the software pre-burned on, on on a piece of hardware uh, shipped to uh, you know a, a deployment team or, or directly to um, on the ground so uh, is, is this the first step towards sort of a, a, a turnkey package Yes, that's right. That's that's the goal, and if everything works out, we'll have this ready for uh, presentation and display at the uh, OLPCFF OLPCSF event in uh, October. Well, <clears throat> a, a practical context is we do have so many grassroots groups around OLPC who are working off the grid, and it's been said that's impossible. Um, and maybe there's a case there, <laughs> but when there's lacking electricity and there's some, sometimes there is no way to even get 3G internet from a cell phone company, there's, there's still schools, and that's a very exciting uh, opportunity for uh, quite a number of Peace Corps volunteers and individuals and, and church groups and you name it who, who followed the OLPC idea. And we see so many of those groups. It'll be interesting to see. Um, you know, it'll be really interesting to see how far that can go. And I don't know if we have time to talk about Internet in a Box and Pathagar, but those bits of community content are what make it exciting. Free content. Sure. I think we uh, we do uh, want to spend some minutes and um, sort of go through some of the top line services that you're looking to, to add on to this. I think that'll be the, you know, first or second question, whether, you know, how do I get it? Is it on some hardware? How much effort is it is to even try it? And then what can it do? Uh, and I'll just, you know, put in um, a uh, request from, uh, you know, my little project in Zambia, which is a children's library. And actually this fall they are building uh, a third library in, halfway in between Lusaka, the capital city, and Livingstone, where the, the big waterfall is, um, and, and the library will be solar powered. So uh, they, this, uh, and they have XOs. So 
uh, this product will be, I, I dare say, almost ideal for their their use. So the, they'll be one of your first customers, I, I hope. Um, so, I mean, getting to what it does, I, I know that on Facebook there was a great question on, um, you know, does it filter uh, if you have Internet access um, uh, out uh, through some sort of satellite or, or a 3G card? Um, you know, aside from the specific learning uh, type resources, can you go over um, the connectivity so so the the server can mediate uh, between uh, a cluster of, of laptops to enable what file sharing? Does it do backups? What are some of the connectivity uh, modes? Jerry, off the top, uh, we have. Uh, backup uh, all PCs, backup uh, utility functioning. So the thanks to George's uh, work on that. Um, we have eJobbered working. We have uh, basic uh, DNS uh, masquerading out to the internet either through uh, network card, 3G, whatever you happen to have for an uplink. So backing up eJabber is the uh, that's chat software, so you can do local chat. Yep, that would tend to take the the XO is out of um, um, a multicast mode and it put a, put a more into uh, unicast connections, which keeps the keeps the wireless waves up mobile cleaner. Uh, and then, um, uh, in terms of uh, backing up, so this is the feature where on an XO laptop it can register uh, yep. itself to a server and then. I mean, then, the backup, little, then the backup ha happens and it registers the eJabbered account. And all that stuff is working. Then we have uh, Squid and Dan's Guardian, or Squid and optionally Dan's Guardian. Um, we can do. Uh, uh, you might explain what those do. Yeah, what's well, Squid? Squid? Squid is an uh, internet proxy. So uh, once, if uh, two or three laptops are going to the same web page, it only retrieves it once. Considering your upstream bandwidth, and Dan's Guardian is a, a plugin for Squid, more or less, that uh, does content filtering, uh, basic keyword blocking. So, uh, if, so if they uh, if happen to look for something they shouldn't, they won't make, they won't be able to see it. Well, that's um, that's tantalizing that you have that kind of um, sort of fundamental control over uh, access uh, to what at, at deployments will be a very limited resource. I don't remember the name of the the packages, and I know there are a number of them, but like at uh, the, the the Zambia de deployment uh, at the library, uh, uh, and I think you, you guys maybe have seen this already in Haiti, but. It, you know, word will catch on very quickly when people discover that there's internet access and um, and, a, and a server that's uh, serving up. How hard would it be to, uh, I think there's what this process is called bandwidth shaping, but also in terms of the access control, can you reserve access to limited connectivity to a class in progress, but also what if someone from the neighborhood wants to come up and check their email and you want to offer connectivity as a public service? Um, is that type of feature in this package or, or possible? It's certainly possible, but it's not the sort of thing that we have uh, had enough time to do. We realize the need for it, and it's on our list. So we got to do one. And uh, the, the things that we've been working on this last sprint were Pathagar and uh, Internet in a Box, which seemed to have uh, a lot more to offer the those schools that were really not well connected, and, uh, and, they were, and content seems to be the king here. We, we're wanting to make the, the infrastructure so that content can begin to accumulate and be served even in offline situations. Well, that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I guess really to serve the use case of at least some laptops, you know, registered to a server, and then we'll we'll look at other um, uh, types of uh, users. Um, so, George, since you 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 
mentioned Pathagar, which uh, is something that I know uh, Samir Verma in San Francisco has been kind of championing, and, and as well as others. And then uh, Internet in a Box. Can you can you go into those two a little more? There, um, I know I've seen I've seen demonstrations of them online, and they look uh, tantalizing. Well, I, I guess yesterday we, or maybe it was the day before yesterday, we were working to get the <clears throat> about <clears throat> about 500 gigabytes of internet in a box working on our uh, on our server, and when it was actually finally working, I started playing with it, and you know I kind of lost track of time. It was fun, so it was actually fun to go and and be able to very quickly go to con video con. Academy or go to Wikipedia in many different languages and of course I chose English and started looking through it and uh, so the real uh, advance is to be able to put you, you can't really download uh, 500 gigabytes of uh, in a box you actually have to physically carry it to the school where uh, where it will be used, but then it's available for all of the clients. And uh, Pathagar is essentially an indexing system for books. So once the indexing is available and there is a means for uploading or adding books to the to the metadata or the database that has all of the books and and provides access by author, by title, by tag, uh, then that can be downloaded and read by the uh, XO. So I don't know what else to, maybe I missed a few things. Mike might mention that we would love to present these two products in future shows because while both contain books, Internet in a Box has over 40,000 books already, whereas Pathagar lets you build up your own digital library in your own school. Um, obviously, there's maps at every level of Zoom for a school that has no internet access, and that's that's never happened before, to have a, a comprehensive CIA-style atlas in the most disconnected villages of the world. So we'd like to probe those two exciting products later. Um, Braddock uh, is in Los Angeles, and I hope he will present that after it's been deployed in Pakistan and a few other places later this year. And likewise, there's new, there's new contributors getting involved with Pathagar, so I hope there can be a separate uh, show on, on that work as well. Yeah, and two interesting pieces about Pathagar and Internet in a Box is they are uh, completely independent projects from the school server. And we just, uh, with, the pl with our modular plugin system, we just plug in, and so anybody who has a content container like this can add that, add their container to uh, the school server. So there's no, these guys are doing their own thing. They have their own standalone projects, and we're just adding value to each other's projects by working together. Yeah, I think, uh, well, I did a quick uh, Friday chat with uh, Samir Verma yesterday, uh, so he'll be in the YouTube video prior to this in the uh, channel. Uh, and so he mentioned, um, the utility of that that modular approach, um, but Dave, like, uh, even though it's modular, I'm just trying to think of, um, you know, so so I have one collection of books. Is is that is that just sort of, uh, you know, uh, can it be its own repository in a folder? Or it's a collection of files, and then is can that be pulled from by Pathagar and Internet in a box? Uh, and then all of that is on your school server project, or how does someone think about, like, like you know, my Zambian friends uh, have scanned uh, books from uh, Zambian children's book authors uh, around the world and are collecting them to take them, take them back to the country. So, so they have, you know, 50 books. You know, where would they live in this ecosystem within a machine? Okay, this, is, we're, this is still kind of evolving because we don't want to force a solution on deployments like you're saying. We want to see what they want to do and then, then enable them. But the most promising approach right now seems to be for the, the deployment level people who are collecting the books to use uh, Calibra, which is another open source software, which is 
client side and it's very full functioned. And from there they can create a library and there's techniques for sharing the libraries among people. And then once that collection is created, you can just copy that over to the school server and uh, Pathogar will serve it up. Now that makes a lot of sense. That's certainly a tool uh, that uh, is uh, widely used and uh, I rely on it a lot myself. So that kind of makes sense that that the um, uh, curators or uh, collections of a corpus of work or body of content kind of do their own metadata, which it's probably best practice they should be doing that anyway, yes, uh, right. and then have that. Um, and is that what they, is that, is that part of the that ODPS standard? There's a or what? What are what would um, you tell someone with a collection of content that they need to have? Um, yeah, and the, the the use case that we're keeping in mind, or at least I'm keeping in mind, is Adam's mom, and she is working on a collection of books for uh, for Haiti. So we're trying to keep in mind what can be as simple as possible for her. And yes, the online digital publishing system is the uh, syndication. Uh, format for that. Uh, Kaliber uses it and many other open source book project products use that. So you just create this collection that uses ODPS as its metadata format and then it can be passed around to any other tool that uses it. I have a couple of couple of questions. Uh, mentioning uh, Calibre there um, got me to thinking about a, a friend of mine who is uh, he's blind and he's often asking about how to break you know, DRM for converting books that he's bought to a format he can use, which makes me think about, you know, um, do you have any, any thoughts about uh, accessibility features going into any of this software or in, into any of these deployments for, you know, deaf or blind or, you know, whatever, captioning software, um, subtitling, that sort of thing. Uh, the other thing, uh, displaying my ignorance, um, have you ever, have you looked at uh, ITELC? That's probably not something you would use, but ITALC, uh, it's, it's kind of a, it's a classroom management uh, software. Um, it's in the links I've, I've been posting into the chat, so if you get curious, you can poke around with that. Okay. Uh, yeah. I will. I th I'm hoping that classroom management becomes a uh, an objective for the release that will come out in the fourth quarter of this year, probably in December. But the initial starting point might be the work that uh, Nepal has has done. It's a very simple Django application, and if we get that working and um, getting uh, communication protocols to the other service going then we might be able to add something more complicated like what you're saying. But the idea is to start very, very simply, get something going in each iteration, add functionality to it. And accessibility side, we have an interesting uh, situation where we have the large deployments like Uruguay where the, uh, this is uh, administered by the Ministry of Education, so it has to meet all of the local jurisdictional requirements for accessibility. So they have actually done a significant amount of accessibility work, but all that happens client-side. So the server doesn't really address accessibility. We depend on the client-side to do that. I know Jerry also from Australia, he's faced a number of accessibility issues. And just as a reminder, access is a, is a big word that affects every kid. And Samir Verma's video from yesterday that Mike Lee interviewed Samir Verma quickly on the um, yeah the Unleash Kids YouTube channel. He has some very interesting thoughts on how expanding kids access to 9 p.m. profoundly changes their whole learning experience and it's it's very hard in Haiti for these overburdened schools to to find a room or a, a way for those kids to take the laptop home and it was a core challenge of OPC to have all the kids take the laptops home, but these kids don't have homes. So it's um, Samir addresses that question, I think, pretty well last night. But that's access writ large is a, is a you know is our core goal here. Is that um, in in the way uh, 
Dave characterizes it. Like I know that there are some client side solutions. Uh, I know there's one on the XO that's bundled in called Info Slicer. Is that potentially an approach that can be added to, I guess, any of these server products? Right? Like someone has an XO and they say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm at the library or I'm at the school and I'm connected to this one of these school server products, and but I want to grab some of these things to take home. Is there going to be a bundling type uh, process that that can happen? That's initiated. Um, yeah, Pathagar allows that, or Pathagar has that built in where there's three different interactions a user has. One is the search library function, which allows them to search the online Pathagar library, Internet Archives library, and a few others that use OPDS. And then from there, they can download it into something called My Library, which is available on their XO on or offline. And if they click on a book from they get the uh, full screen reader. But uh, Internet in a Box is, that is a, an online only feature right now. Um, so, I've, so I've already had this question um, in sort of cursory discussions with uh, my librarian friends and, uh, you know, in the way uh, that uh, classroom situations have to assess imp impact and engagement, uh, you know, librarians, um, want to know how many patrons they're serving and who's coming into the library. Uh, is there going to, or can you envision a way, uh, or maybe this is already happening, but do the server logs capture, you know, you know, machine number two out of this group of 12, you know, came into the server and downloaded these books at this date and time stamp? Is, is that the kind of thing that's already being captured? I believe the data is there, but when there is a data store backup automatically happening, and then the question is, it's certainly a possible thing to summarize or to drill down into that data, but we have not written the uh, activity. We don't really know what what the requirements would be for that, but that's, a, that's an opportunity, but not in the current plan. So when we talk about um, th this uh, particular school server um, effort that you're working on now being modular, I, I think that sounds like it's modular in that it uh, there's uh, these loosely coupled products like Pathagar and Internet in a Box that can coexist with some of the code that you're working on. Um, is there something uh, at a more feature level that's possible, like plugins, like maybe Kevin's request for accessibility or the librarians wanting some sort of, um, you know, uh, logging system for check-ins and checkouts. Is that, would you, would, could that be thought of as a feature uh, mechanism that you would think of as extensions or plugins? Am I? Yeah, that's, that's uh, precisely the design. It's uh, modeled very much off the, the way that distributions have packages in that you have a core set of packages which kind of makes the thing run and then specific users pick and choose what packages they want based on their particular needs and the module and the, the plugin design that uh, George and Jerry came up with is is very similar and there's about 20 different plugins right now which uh, a deployment can just turn on or turn off as they want and hopefully the and the idea was before when it was more monolithic it was it was tighter and uh, and smaller, but this allows people like Kevin Cole, if he wants to do something, uh, wants to add a package, or a plugin. He doesn't need to understand the entire system. He only needs to understand the uh, the plugin API. So hopefully, it will do reduce the barrier of entry to uh, new participants. Well, I think that'll be fabulous. So if, if basically uh, someone who uh, knows how to develop for these. Uh, uh, you know, in, in these different programming languages, and go look up your your specification for plugins, and and, and then uh, be able to get a start there. So, you know, it seems like uh, the imperative now is, and this is what we're doing, is to get the word out there that um, that these types of opportunities are 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 surfacing in your system. Yeah, a lot of a lot of um, my personal effort at this point right now it is going out there and contacting the deployments and trying to ask them what do you use. You have code out there, and can we turn that into a plugin and put it on the system so it's available for the world? So uh, that's a lot of what's driving the plugins. 
Mike, just to give you an example, you asked about bandwidth shaping. Um, we don't know if this is going to happen, but um, we've talked to Mike Dawson in Afghanistan and Dubai, who has um, quite a, a, a nice um, set of um, web tools when you have a very slow connection to your school in Afghanistan. So you can, you can use that bandwidth very efficiently. And I believe he's uh, selling that as an, uh, an open source uh, product called NetSpeed Manager or something like that off of his uh, Paiwastun website, but could also be a plug-in to this XSCE here. So we'll see how that goes. Well, specifically like that, uh, the bandwidth uh, sort of so-called shaping addresses the situation we all run into uh, trying to use uh, connected to the internet at uh, coffee shops or at the airport or, or whatever where there's a, a bunch of users on one access point and someone, you know, starts a, a, a YouTube video or a net Netflix movie and it kills it for everybody else. So um, is that, I guess that'll be a Mike Dawson's product, right, where you can sort of say, hey, in this classroom situation, you're going to cap, you know, videos uh, uh, transferred over the local Wi-Fi at a certain Speed, I guess that's what shaping is, right? Um, sure. I mean, we know that little boys want to check the sports scores all across Africa, and that's not the only purpose for your school's <laughs> digital library. So do look at Mike Dawson's website, piwastoon.net, and, you know, if anyone's interested in that open source product, and, you know, maybe that'll encourage him to <laughs> integrate it with School Server Community Edition. Can you spell that, Pi? Uh, Pai Wastun is P-A-I. Uh, how do you spell it? Someone help me out. <laughs> It'll be on the YouTube channel. We did a, okay. a whole show on uh, with Mike Dawson, so uh, there's links uh, oh, okay. right under that caption uh, on the YouTube channel uh, and, and all the promotions for that show. So, uh, yeah, that's up there. Um, so we heard a little bit about Calibre, which is great. I've learned a lot uh, about how the, the, this sort of desktop tool works with Pathagar. Um but uh, can we touch a little bit more um, uh, and sort of we can go another five or ten minutes here, I think, or slightly longer. Uh, I don't know that we've gotten questions. I'll check as well. But uh, Internet in a Box, I mean, I've watched the presentations on that, and, and you kind of touched on the capabilities. But um, and, and as Adam said, uh, both Pathagar and Internet in a Box deserve their own shows. They're kind of uh, definitely deep uh, uh, products and efforts. But... Uh, but can someone get into Braddock's work with Internet in a Box, just where it came from and some of the top-line features? I think George has done the most work there. I mean, we know it includes OpenStreetMap, which is amazing. Uh, it, it is the crowdsourced, people-owned map of the world. If you haven't checked it out, you should. Within three days after Haiti's earthquake, I think something like 90% of the roads in Haiti were put onto OpenStreetMap.org, which was not the case for Google Maps. Um, so it's really an amazing thing that people can improve the map of their own neighborhood. And if you're not familiar with that, um, Google Maps is not the only game in town. Um, finally, there's, I mean, yeah, George should just explain, but there's over 40,000 Gutenberg free books, etc. Well, I think that uh, Braddock Gaskell has just said, taken the approach, there is an awful lot of free material. How can I uh, warehouse that and make it available? And so he's really worked to, to find the, eliminate duplicates from Project Gutenberg and uh, winnow it down to really usable uh, books in mostly English, I think, but I, I don't really know. I haven't looked down through the through the tree. Um, no, I I don't know much about uh, of internet in a box. It just sort of surfaced in Caltech, and I guess Adam went to a presentation uh, that was kind of an introduction to the project, uh, maybe in the spring of this year, and uh, we got a a, a um, hard disk shipped to me, and I brought it up here, and we 
we turned it on and basically you know got it got the interface working and I don't know very much about it except uh, just playing with it and there's maps there's some sort of uh, a library of um, video and um, art art history there's uh, of course all the books and uh, the con videos and what else and just a reminder that that when you have Wikipedia in 40 languages, we take that for granted. And it, it just doesn't seem very exciting for people in the rich west or the rich east or the rich south or whatever. It's just completely taken for granted. That's not what we're talking about here. Um, these are people who've never had 10 books in their village. So this is a big experiment. What happens? I guess I'd like... I want to just say that I ha I have I bought a 100 watt uh, solar panel and I've had a, a, a one point an XO 1.75 running as a school server uh, continuously for four months and uh, so I can just imagine if there was a internet in a box connected to that server and that information was available to clients I think it's a real uh, the the package is more than just a uh, just all of the individual elements. Well, and Samir, when I was chatting with him last night, spoke briefly about um, the Bagmalpur uh, deployment that's his hometown uh, in this remote village uh, in India, sort of outside of New Delhi. And uh, uh, with what he's done, um, you know, uh, in a similar way, uh, packaging up the internet, it's literally possible with um, miniaturization of. Uh, you know, computers and uh, physical storage to, to put a significant chunk of open content, as you guys have been describing, uh, into this little box that can be solar powered and put it in front of a child. So he recounted some vignettes uh, on children's first encounters with some of these similar resources. I think he has all of the TED videos, you know, as well. Uh, but Yes, we'll do that in a future show, and uh, I know that, as they say in the um, technology world, it, was, it wasn't trivial for Bata to uh, capture open street maps. I think that was uh, initially many weeks of, uh, you know, machine crunching on um, the map repository to, to, to store it all uh, in an offline uh, fashion, but also make it navigable and zoomable, uh, you know, and then have the, all the videos on that, and... Uh, you know, one thing I hope, you know, for all of these projects is, um, and I know that there's a camp uh, behind me, is, you know, um, like uh, graphical user interfaces or, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, in, in not only in the configuration but the administration of these tools um, that sort of allow uh, non-technical people to kind of, uh, you know, be able to do this. I know in the, the deployments, uh, especially the smaller ones, they won't have dedicated IT staff. So it's it's really, really uh, exciting and maybe even game-changing that we're on the brink of being able to, you know, sh ship a small, you know, box, you know, to a deployment that's got the Wi-Fi antenna on it, you know, a big chunk of the Internet, uh, and then if you can find a way to give it clean power, um, you know, Give it, give the internet to whatever, and, it, and we should point out that um, you know this isn't for EXO laptops necessarily, but uh, any device that has a web browser, uh, including a, a feature phones and smartphones. Right. Now, locally, we've got you know the folks from uh, the New America Foundation um, Open Technology uh, Institute who've been doing a lot of, you know, within the U.S., showing communities how they can set up wireless mesh networks and that sort of thing with small hardware. So it might be worth talking to folks there and seeing whether or not uh, they have any advice or, or have questions that, you know, that might have come out of your work, you know, just... just not so much in the the software, but in terms of uh, small technology that you can use to, uh, you know, get mesh networks up in a community. 
Um, there, there may be some room for exchange there with those folks. Well, I, I mean, I can amplify that uh, and, and kind of selfishly speak from inside the Beltway. Um, uh, you know, it's I know that the, the community is sort of coalescing uh, and their efforts, uh, and, I, and I love this kind of modular approach. Uh, but, you know, if you want to think about... Um, you know, support in terms of funding uh, and uh, people with large bullhorns. Uh, I know that after we, some of this is demonstrated in October, uh, next year that we really should firmly look at opportunities like uh, in the first week of August I'll be at the um, USAID uh, Global Education Summit uh, displaying our eToys project. Uh, but that crowd, uh, World Bank folks, um, they would all, uh, I mean, you can envision an, an offline internet, you know, summit, uh, and I, it's, you know, I mean, I don't want to be DC centric or inside the Beltway centric, but, uh, certainly, um, uh, there's a lot of folks here that would, would, uh, sort of go nuts over, uh, seeing this. Yeah, that, that would be great. Our, our piece right now, I think what we're, what, what we're feeling is the, the need to prove that we have an impact, prove that what we have has value, so these other organizations will start to say, "Look at these! Look at this group! This seems like a sane organization doing uh, doing good work. Let's let's figure out how to work together." And it's a big experiment. Like um, Internet in a Box has um, undergone years of work by Braddock and his volunteers out of Los Angeles and, and far beyond. So when this is used in Haiti, there's a principal in Haiti who's famously said. My children don't believe that people have walked on the moon. I want encyclopedias in, in my school. The flip side of that is if you go from three books in a village to a terabyte, I'm very sympathetic to Kevin Cole's talk about community networks because we just don't know what's going to happen if you suddenly give a village that has three books, 40,000 books, thousands of videos, encyclopedias in 40 languages. It's a really interesting experiment and in fact if, if, if you want to play philosophical games you could imagine you could fill this terabyte full of misinformation because right a village that's been very disconnected from the world will just have to believe everything we give them and there's some very interesting you know curious questions there that philosophically minded people might want to uh, entertain on are all the books in a library true etc. Well, that's certainly an opportunity for um, a whole bunch of curriculum about, uh, you know, the bias and, and, and politics <laughs> uh, that, that are behind uh, information um, and the dissemination of it. Right. Uh, it, it brings, yeah, the, whole, it brings yeah, the whole yeah. question home of have, uh, have we come from outer space to land on the moon or, or landed from a helicopter in a, into a little village? <laughs> Well, you, you have to start with some, you know, as much as you can, critical thinking st skills and, and, you know, verify stuff. I mean, it, it comes back to earlier stuff where people were in the U.S. where uh, you, you would see all these articles in the newspaper about, oh, my gosh, you know, kids are accessing the Internet. What if they you know, get the wrong information. Well, you know, yeah, that's, you know, that's not a new problem. It's not a problem that is just a result of having technology. It's, it's always been there. Technology just makes more of it. So, yeah, um, information wants to be free, and so does misinformation. Well, we'll certainly see in, in Haiti, which which is lacking a culture of libraries, if we can help build such a culture. Hello. This is uh, this is uh, going to be one of your future testers. This is uh, CC, and uh, sorry you can't hear uh, through my headphone, but uh, these are the guys working on something called the school server. So you can be sitting out in the woods, pulling down YouTube videos. And uh, I think I think she may want to ask: um, Can you put like game files on the server? Can can there be interactive content? 
I, I, th I think the answer is yes. Our so. would like that. Yes, your friend would like that. All right. <laughs> um, so uh, I think we've covered it. We're uh, sort of at the hour mark on um, the uh, broadcast. And uh, does do we want to just go across the uh, the, the thumbnails uh, of our screen here um, and uh, have any final thoughts? Um, I've put up a bunch of links, so if you want to copy and paste them, uh, I've also been keeping track of them elsewhere, so uh, if you don't, you, know, you can get them from me later. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that those might get flushed after this. Uh, um, I close the interface, so that's great. Right. If, you if you save them. You can yeah. copy and paste Yeah, and them. I can do that too, yeah. Uh, so Jerry, any final thoughts? Well, the, project's gonna, the project's going to keep growing as more and more content uh, and features get added to the, the server project. It's just going to get better and better. Uh, Adam, what's next? Uh, do you have more sprints coming up? I guess uh, October sounds like a, um, a kind of a milestone for getting a uh, a robust demo going. Uh, yeah, I would also love it. We'll just have to see. If we can afford San Francisco, um, if since we've had all our events in Canada, all five of these these hacking sprints in Canada so far, if um, I mean Canada's a great place, um, don't get me wrong, but if we could maybe try another country, <laughs> and uh, it's great that so many Americans have come up north of the border to help, but you know not everyone can afford to fly to Canada or San Francisco, so. You know, who knows? In November, there's a Malaysia summit, November 16th and 18th, uh, and OLPC volunteers or a general um, community summit. So that's that's where things will get more interesting if we move out of our, you know, essentially white North American developer dreams and and, and meet the real world. And so that's where we want to head. Um, finally. Uh, you know, not to diss Canada, but our host sitting right next to me here has opened up his, his essentially his childhood home and his uh, his camper, where uh, you know everything has happened this week. Um, so it, it gave us a, a little realization of what it's like to work off a three G modem in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and George can explain how he wants us to try a more extreme. Uh, sprint in the future if he wants. <laughs> yeah. Oh, a, a Haiti sprint, right, George? No, th this one would be to run off of solar power off of batteries. See if we can do that. So, uh, is that your your final thought? Is uh, on onward to solar for s solar sprints? Huh? Dave, any final thoughts? Um, no, I'm just happy to be. Uh, proud to be part of this project and uh, to kind of play a role in all the, the hard work that people like uh, Tim, who's not here today, and George and Jerry have been putting in for months, hacking away in their basements. And uh, now we can we can share it with the world and, and create some impact from their hard work rather than having that be lost. I think it's important that, that there are people remember others who, whose names have not been in the last hour. I mean, I can't name them all, but Anna Schoolfield has been running this server software in her own house for probably, I don't know, four years. In Birmingham, Alabama. Yeah, in, in Alabama, uh, hosting a community. I, I believe it's a, a very international community. Um, so she's now helping to QA a lot of this work. Well, I'd it, like to mention Daniel Drake too. He did an awful lot of improvement of the school server in in strategic time, very quickly, and I really am amazed at the at the quality of his improvement. So, you know, there are a lot of shoulders that we're standing on. It's well, and how long has uh, uh, Daniel been in uh, Nicaragua? Is that where he is now? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But, he, he rolled with a seven from Nicaragua, I believe, you know, remotely. So. And we could go on forever. I mean, Tony Anderson has brought 
a version of this school server to so many countries I can't even count. Um, but starting with Nepal work, taking some of that to Haiti, Rwanda, Lesotho, I'm sure I've forgotten other countries. And that's really important to me to see a principal's reaction. Um, it's, it's a different problem from serving thousands of schools across Uruguay, but I think it's, it's, it's just as informative. All right, uh, Kevin Cole, any parting thoughts? Well, I, uh, I, uh, I'm here as just a, a, a visitor. <laughs> okay, uh, and I, I'm just uh, glancing over here at my other laptop to just make sure that we didn't uh, get any other questions from online. I don't have any... Uh, emails from Sora, so I think we'll wind it down here and, uh, and hopefully we'll just um, uh, keep tabs on your progress. Uh, it'll be real easy to do uh, a hangout on um, the next uh, batch of news you have to report on and uh, I think as we've all said, um, you know, plenty of conversations to be had, uh, uh, particularly in, in Pathagar and Internet in a Box. Um, uh, deserving their own shows. So, Mike, can I yeah. squeeze in a, a request for volunteers? Yes, what, yes let's okay. have that call to action uh, okay. here as we wind down. Uh, what, what do we need? And uh, what are our, our website at schoolserver.org is a wiki, and that's very useful to people like us. Unfortunately, it's confusing to some uh, of the teachers and principals and parents that want to use this. So if, if someone has that, those communication talents, it would be very useful to us to take what's on schoolserver.org and add photos or use cases or whatever and present this to maybe it's a, maybe it's a parochial school, you know, in regional with 10 schools or whatever. So that's a translation task to take geek speak into education speak, and we have a lot of work to do there, if people can help. Well, and I think that can be accelerated by, um, yeah, what, what help you can get in terms of that, that page, but I think there's, to the extent that we can get this shown into other large communities like, you know, the American Library Association, I mean, there's just, you know, entire uh, realms of people that um, uh, would be amazed by uh, a lot of this work, so. Um, with that, I think we've uh, uh, sort of hit our time, and uh, I'll ask you to all enjoy the rest of your weekend, and uh, everyone um, tuning in to just check on uh, youtube.com slash unleashedkids, facebook.com slash unleashedkids, uh, all the school server-related links that we mentioned and that uh, Kevin Cole has collected a lot of, um, we'll be posting in the captions under this um, uh, archived YouTube video. So there's a little show more button that you'll see there that uh, you can expand out uh, and get the other links. And then we'll also grab those packs of links and put them wherever we can on Facebook and on uh, Google+. So uh, we'll sign off, guys. Thanks a lot. And if you can uh, hang on, we'll, we'll do some after-show chat for a minute. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. You're doing an incredible job with this Unleashed Kids project. Thanks. It's been a lot of fun.